Mrs H here, we're going to put our kidney knowledge to the test by having a go at some exam questions. So number one, the body responds to changes in room temperature. Which row of the table shows what happens when there is an increase in room temperature? So we've got sweat production and urine production. Does the sweat production increase and does the urine production decrease? Well, I don't think we need to go any further because that is the right answer, isn't it? You lose water when you sweat. So your kidneys will not make as much urine because they'll try to reabsorb more water to keep the water balanced in your blood. Question two, explain what is meant by homeostasis. That is the maintenance of a constant internal environment despite internal or external changes. Negative feedback mechanisms or processes ensure that any changes are reversed back to the optimum or normal conditions. Number three, the levels of hormone ADH vary in the human body. Complete the sentence by putting a cross in the box next to your answer. ADH affects the collecting duct by increasing its permeability to water, which decreases urine production. We know it increases the permeability, don't we? So let's just de discount B and D for a minute. Let's look at C. Increasing its permeability to water, increasing urine production. Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? Because if you remember the structure of the nephron, ADH makes the collecting duct more permeable to water. So more water is reabsorbed into the blood. Therefore, less water will go to the bladder as part of the urine. So it is definitely A. Number four, the graph shows the level of ADH in the blood of one person during one day. So we've got level of ADH on the Y axis and the time of day on the X axis, right? State a reason for the level of ADH production at three o'clock, so 300 hours. Well, if we find 1500 on the X axis, so three o'clock, we can see the ADH level is high compared to just before and just after. And we know ADH makes the collecting duct more permeable, so more water is reabsorbed back into the blood. So what's the question again? Why might that be high at three o'clock? Maybe the person is dehydrated, so they need more water in the blood. Maybe they have been exercising and they are sweating so they have lost water and they need to reabsorb more water back into the blood. So it could be a few things there. Number five, urine contains the waste product urea. State how and where urea is produced. Well, excess amino acids are converted to urea in the liver. Now, for some exam boards, such as Edexcel, they have to know that this conversion is called deamination, but for AQA, you don't need to know the name of that. You just need to know excess amino acids are converted. Number six, glucose and urea are transported in the blood to nephrons. The diagram shows a nephron with a glucose and urea concentration at locations labelled P, Q and R. Calculate the percentage decrease in glucose concentration between location P and location Q. Well, to calculate a percentage decrease, you put what the change was. So what was the decrease divided by the original times 100? So that is, if you look at your information in the boxes, 170 minus 80 at Q divided by 170, which is what it started out as at P, times that by 100 and you end up with 52.94%. Now the number of significant figures or decimal places have not been specified in this question. So there are a range of correct answers you could put here, 52.94% or you could round this up to 53% or even 52.9%. Describe how glucose is removed from the nephron. Well, this process of reabsorbing glucose from the nephron back into the blood is called selective reabsorption. 
So this will be a mark saying selective reabsorption. Do you remember where in the nephron this happens? It happens at the first coiled tubule, which is labelled as Q on the diagram given. And glucose is reabsorbed actually by a combination of diffusion and active transport. But it is active transport that will ultimately ensure all glucose is removed from the nephron and reabsorbed into the blood against its concentration gradient. You might even want to add that active transport requires energy. Explain the change in the concentration of urea between location Q and R. Well, as more water is reabsorbed at the collecting duct, which is R, so that means water goes back into the blood by osmosis, then the relative concentration of urea will actually increase. So the marks going here are for reabsorbed, urea concentration increases, Notice in the question, they use the word change. This is a deliberate use of a bad word because they are inviting you to say whether the urea concentration increases or decreases. Using the word change is very vague and you're not allowed to do it. Complete the sentence by putting a cross in the box next to your answer. Urea enters the nephron through the Bowman's capsule, bladder, collecting duct, loop of Henley. Well, we definitely know it's not the bladder or the collecting duct because they're later on. And But it is the Bowman's capsule. You don't actually need to know this name if you're doing AQA specification. Which hormone controls the permeability of the collecting duct? That is ADH or antidiuretic hormone. And complete the sentence by putting a cross in the box next to your answer. Urine is transported from the bladder through the renal artery, renal vein, ureter, urethra. Mm. You need to remember the difference between ureter and urethra. Well, it is actually the urethra. The ureters take the urine from the kidney to the bladder and the urethra takes the urine from the bladder to the outside. Question seven, people with diabetes insipidus are unable to produce enough of the hormone ADH. In a medical study, the ADH levels in the blood of eight people were measured. Four of the people, A, B, C and D, do not have diabetes insipidus. The other four people, E, F, G and H, do have diabetes insipidus. The results are shown in the tables below. Now we're not to confuse this type of diabetes with the sugar diabetes. We haven't heard of this before necessarily, but it does tell us everything we need to. So someone with diabetes insipidus cannot produce enough ADH. Right, calculate the mean ADH level in the people without diabetes insipidus. So we're just gonna add all of those up divided by four which gives us 4.1. We'll do it to one decimal place, just like all the other numbers are in the same column. Suggest so why there is a wide range of ADH levels in the people without diabetes insipidus. Well, the question is asking you to suggest, so you might have a variety of reasons here. There is variation in a population. So for example, people could have different body sizes. Different people will drink at different times obviously there are fluid and food intake could be at different times of the day at exercise these daily fluctuations are not dealt with effectively by people who have diabetes insipidus because they can't produce the ADH to get more water to go back into their blood that explains why there is a range in people who don't have diabetes insipidus their pituitary gland is simply responding to these fluctuations. You might also put there that some people have varying degrees of salt intake because the more salt you consume, the more water you are going to hang on to and less water you're going to lose in your urine. Right, complete the sentence by putting a cross in the box next to your answer. ADH is a hormone released into the blood by the pituitary gland. Suggest a symptom of diabetes insipidus. 
Well, if people with diabetes insipidus are not secreting enough ADH, then less water is going to be reabsorbed into the blood, which means they are gonna have more in their urine. So increased volume of urine can lead to excessive thirst and dehydration and actually death. It's a very serious condition. Explain the role of ADH in regulating the water content of the blood. Well, we can use the flow chart we learnt about in my kidney video. Once you have that imprinted in your memory, then it becomes really easy to recall the diagram from your mind to answer a six marker question. So here we go. An increase in water concentration in the blood is detected by the hypothalamus, which sends an electrical impulse to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland secretes less ADH, so there is less ADH to target the collecting duct, making it less permeable. This means less water will be reabsorbed into the blood leading to an increased volume of urine. A decrease of water concentration in the blood is detected by the hypothalamus, which sends an electrical impulse to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland secretes more ADH, because we need to get more water back into the blood, which targets the collecting duct, making it more permeable. More water will be reabsorbed into the blood by osmosis, meaning, there will be less water in the urine. Water concentration in the blood is back to normal. This is negative feedback, which brings about homeostasis. We've got question eight. The diagram shows the body's response to dehydration. Now we're practicing these questions. You can see that they start to become repetitive, which is why it's very good to practice exam questions. So this is a similar question. This is only four marks this time. Let's just annotate the diagram so we remember the key words we need to put into our answer as the diagram is deliberately vague. Look at that, dehydration, brain, hormone response. Okay, it's inviting us to add those key words in. So we've got, in the brain, we've got two parts we need to mention, the hypothalamus, which detects the dehydration the low water concentration in the blood. Then that's gonna send an impulse to the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland is gonna secrete ADH and the ADH is going to target the collecting duct of the nephron in the kidney. And there's our answer. We just need to put it in words now. Dehydration leads to a low water concentration in the blood which is detected by the hypothalamus which sends an electrical impulse to the pituitary gland the pituitary gland secretes ADH, which makes the collecting duct more permeable, so more water is reabsorbed into the blood. And last question. Figure two shows information about some of the components in the blood and in the filtrate in this part of the nephron. So what we've got, different components, glucose, protein, red blood cells, white blood cells, concentration in the blood concentration in the filtrate in the nephron. So we can see that glucose is the same in the blood as it is in the nephron. Protein is only in the blood. Red blood cells are only in the blood and white blood cells are only in the blood. So explain why there are differences in the concentrations of some components in the blood and some components in this part of the nephron. Protein, red blood cells and white blood cells are too big to be pushed out of the blood through the capillary walls of the glomerulus. But glucose is small enough to pass through the capillary walls of the glomerulus and into the nephron. So that's why you have those differences. And finally, state the name of the hormone that regulates the water content of the blood I hope you know this by now, and that is ADH or antidiuretic hormone. You only need to write one or the other because they mean the same thing and you're allowed an abbreviation at GCSE. Thanks for watching. I hope you found that useful and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content.